from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division, and today it is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome to the Library His Royal Highness Prince Eremia Haile Selassie. It is the first time that a member of the Imperial Family of Ethiopia has graced the hallowed halls of the Library of Congress with their presence, and certainly the first time that a member of the family will make a presentation on its long and prestigious history. As many of you already know, when Emperor Haile Selassie I of Ethiopia was crowned on November 2, 1930, his titles included King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah, and Elect of God. And so we're all looking, very much looking forward to hearing about the Lion of Judah. But now may I introduce Dr. Peggy Perstein, head of the Hebraic section, where the collection of Ethiopian material lies. Dr. Perstein. Good afternoon. As uh, Dr. Deeb mentioned, I'm Peggy Prostein. I'm head of the Hebraic section in the African and Middle Eastern Division of the Library of Congress. And our wonderful collection of materials uh, that, uh, that are here, here are part of the Hebraic section. And uh, before this presentation today, um, His Royal Highness, Prince Ermia Saleh Selassie, uh, came upstairs to the African Middle Eastern Division and our reference librarian in charge of the materials, Fentahun Tiruna, uh, made a wonderful presentation of manuscripts, newspapers, maps, and contemporary materials. So we're very pleased to have the materials here at the Library of Congress and we encourage you to come and use them. Uh, as I mentioned to the Prince, the collection is used um, but we're always happy to have uh, other people come and make discoveries as well. And so now I'd like to turn the program over to Fenta, who will introduce the Prince. Thank you very much, Peggy, for the introduction. <coughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. Um, this is a program I have been looking forward uh, to for a long time. And I'm very, very thankful for uh, His Royal Highness, uh, er uh, Prince Ermias, for accepting my invitation. Um, I would like to begin by uh, a statement about myself uh, in relation to the royal family. If admitted, I would like to include a bit of personal history that I was a participant in the opposition to the monarchy uh, in the university uh, days, in my university uh, days as a student. I do not want to engage in criticizing the educational system in the Haile Selassie University that I was engaged in uh, for failing short of instruction, instructing its citizens with their true history. But I will admit there was a general ignorance in the academia in the knowledge of the long and glorious history from the dynastic Cushitic sovereigns to the Solomonic line of sovereigns. It is a sort of, a sort of cathartic uh, to me to have the, uh, the princes of Ethiopia with me in one hall uh, to remind each other to once again archive document and preserve this glorious history of, uh, for posterity. So I'm so happy that we came together uh, finally. I will now begin to introduce uh, Prince Hermias. His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Hermias, President of the Crown Council of Ethiopia, is the only son of His late Imperial Highness, Prince Sahale Selassie Haile Selassie, and Her Imperial Highness, 
Princess Mahesanta Habtamarian. The late Prince Sahala Selassie was the youngest son of His Imperial Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie and Empress Menon of Ethiopia. His Royal Highness Prince Hermias was born in Addis Ababa on June 14, 1960 and lived in Ethiopia for a considerable part of his early life where he had his primary education. He continued his studies at the Old Ride Preparatory School and then at the Haleybury College in England. He graduated with an undergraduate degree in the Social Studies emphasis in Economics from the University of California <coughs> in Santa Barbara. He continued his education at the Fletcher School of Law in, and Diplomacy between 1983 and 1985. His Royal Highness is the father of two sons, Prince Sahal Selassie and Prince Fissahation, born on February the 20th, 1992. Prince Hermes has a diverse professional background and has been uh, deeply involved in the development and in in institutionalization of democratic principles and market economic philosophies in Africa, particularly in the Horn. He is an active member of the expatriate Ethiopian community in the United States and actively follows issues related to the Horn of Africa. In 1993, Prince Hermias was invested in exile as the president of the Ethiopian Crown Council, the body which acts during an interregnum as the custodian of the crown and which during the reign of an emperor acts as the principal advisory body to the crown. The appointment was made by the late Emperor Amha Selassie I. Upon his installment, the prince has traveled extensively and met with a dozen heads of state promoting the welfare of Ethiopia and Ethiopians. In 1998, he briefed the United States Congress on two occasions regarding the prospects for peace in the Horn of Africa. This included a special briefing to the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee on October 14, 1998. In 1997, High, uh, His, uh, His Royal Highness was named the recipient of the International Strategic Studies <coughs> Association Silver Star Award for outstanding contributions to strategic progress through humanitarian achievement by the worldwide, worldwide NGO, the International Strategic Studies Association, for his accomplishment in supporting Ethiopian refugees. His Highness is patron of the Haile Selassie Fund for Ethiopia's Children, Incorporated, uh, a US-based non-profit charitable trust which raises funds for causes which aid Ethiopian children, including scholarships. I now call upon His Royal Highness, Prince Ermia Haile Selassie, to the podium to give us his presentation on the Lion of Judah. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends, scholars and distinguished guests. It is my great honor and privilege to be here with you today in the renowned Hebraic section of the United States Library of Congress, African and Middle Eastern Division. To begin with, I will share with you an ancient Ethiopian saying, we must study the past and understand the present to, uh, to charter a better future for us all. I must tell you that I am not a theologian and make no pretense at being so. Indeed, some, perhaps many of you, already possess extensive knowledge of today's subject, the origins and religious symbolism of the Lion of Judah. Consequently, I will initially introduce the subject and hopefully end with a robust question and answer period, which I anticipate will prove both entertaining and enlightening for all of us. It is with great reverence, humility, and some concern I come before you to discuss and explore this topic. My concern springs from the certain and harsh knowledge that whenever poetry and magic of myth is interpreted as biography 
history or science, it is frequently mortally wounded. The living images become only remote facts of a distant time or sky, and it's never difficult to demonstrate that as science and history, mythology is in a large part absurd. Thus, when a civilization begins to reinterpret its mythology in this way as biography, history, or science, the life goes out of it. Temples become museums or tourist attractions, and the link between the two perspectives is dissolved. In modern times, arguably, such blight has even descended on the Holy Bible, both in the Old and New Testament, and a great part of the Christian movement. The late and renowned American mythologist, writer, and lecturer, Joseph Campbell, has observed that symbols are simply the vehicles of communication, and that they must not be mistaken for the final term the tenor of their reference. Thus, no matter how attractive or impressive symbols may seem, they remain but convenient means accommodated to the understanding. Hence, the personality or personalities of God, whether represented in the Trinitarian, dualistic, or Unitarian terms, picturally or verbally, has doc as documented fact or apocalyptic vision, no one should attempt to read or interpret them as the final thing. The abiding challenge of the theologian is to keep the symbol translucent so that it may not block out the very light that it's supposed to convey. For then alone do we know God, writes St. Thomas Aquinas, when we believe that he is far above all that man can possibly think. Thus, mistaking a symbolic ve vehicle for his tenor can lead to spilling not only of valueless ink, but also valueless blood. To bring the images back to life, one must seek not interesting applications to modern affairs, but illuminating hints from the inspired past. When these are found, vast areas of half-dead iconography <coughs> disclose again their enduring and permanently human meaning. In the Jewish tradition, the earliest reference to, to the line of Judah comes from Genesis, in the first book of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, and the Christian Old Testament. The book of Genesis is generally considered to have been written sometime between 1400 and 1440 BC. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 9, when blessing his son Judah, the Jewish patriarch Jacob refers to Judah as the young lion. Thus, here we first note the lion becoming metaphorically and symbolically paired with Judah and the Jews. It is also from this text that the lion of Judah further evolves into a titular station or office, defender and leader of the Jewish tribe, which itself becomes the basis of considerable messianic expectation and speculation in early Judaism. Indeed, King David, the Jewish big messiah, becomes inextricably and historically linked in the Judaic and Christian tradition as the reference for the Lion of Judah. We frequently find lion gates in ar archaeological ruins from Israel to the gates of Ethiopia's Aksumite empires, palaces and temples, to the Hittite sites in Turkey, to the Babylonian and Persian sites in Iraq, or the Assyrian and Egyptian sites. It was widespread and popular symbol of royalty, as the lion was seen by many as the king of the predators, or even as the king of all the beasts. In fact, we know that Ramses II kept life lions, as did successive Ethiopian emperors, including up until the time of my late grandfather, the last emperor, Haile Selassie I. In ancient J Jewish art, we often also find lions depicted in protective roles, guarding the Ark of the Covenant at chapel entrances, as in the sculpture of the ancient synagogues at Sardis, Horazim or Baram in Palestine, and in many of the mosaics dating from the early Byzantine era. In medieval Jewish art, the lion pair is commonly depicted leaning up on either side of the tree of life next to the crown. Thus, it is the heraldic shield replaced by a symbol of God, and the lions are seen as serving the king of all kings. 
In modern times, the Jewish heraldic representation of the city of Jerusalem remains the venerable line of Judah. In the subsequent Christian tradition, the lion allegory persists in the New Testament book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 5. And one of the elders said, said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to open the seven seals thereof. Although the dominant image of Jesus in Revelation is the slain, but now the triumphant lamb, the Apostle John continues to employ the par powerful and traditional lion symbol. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 5, it proclaims that the lion of the tribe of Judah has already triumphed, not through final judgment on the wicked, but rather through his atoning death and opening up the possibility for all of us to be saved. Christ, therefore, is worthy to unseal the judgment scroll because he has already achieved salvation through his death as the slain and sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the world's sin. Theologians generally concede that the symbol is read and understood as direct reference to Jesus, where he is regarded as the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. In Christianity, the lion of Judah symbol is commonly used to refer to Jesus Christ. In fact, many Christian ministries use the symbol as their emblem or prefix to their names. Christians believe that while the ancient tribe of Levi prepared priests, that of Judah was the tribe of kings. Jesus is believed to be descendant of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is commonly referred to as the overcoming one and the one qualified to open the scrolls and the seven seals. According to the book of Revelation, Jesus was the sacrificial lamb and the lion of Judah. The prophecy of the coming of the Lord to judge the world as the Lion of Judah is clear throughout Revelations. As the Earth's oldest independent nation, Ethiopia traces its unbroken history back to more than five millennia. The earliest records of Ethiopia around 3000 BC, just prior to the Egyptian Old Kingdom, came from Egypt Egyptian traders who referred to the lands south of nu Nubia as Punt or Yam. The first known Egyptian voyage to Pont occurred in the 25th century BC under the reign of Pharaoh Saure. The most famous Egyptian expedition to Pont, however, comes during the reign of Queen Hatshepsut, probably around 1495 BC, as the expedition was memorialized in the intricately carved reliefs on the temple of Der al-Bahri at Thebes. There are also numerous references to Ethiopia in the Old Testament of the Hebrews and the Christian Bibles. As the Old Testament is to the Hebrews or the Quran is to Islam, the Qibran August or the Book of the Glory of Kings of Ethiopia is the ancient and revealed repository of our country's millennia-old national and religious history as well as our constitution. More than 700 years old in its present and written form, the Qibran August derives from Ethiopia's millennium old oral tradition and details the history and origin of the Solomonic line of Ethiopian kings. It is also regarded to be the definitive authority on the history of the conversion of Ethiopia to Christianity. The Solomonic dynasty of Ethiopia is so named by the virtue of the dynastic descent from the union of the venerable Jewish Messiah King Solomon of Israel and the Queen of Sheba more than 900 years BC. By Ethiopian dynastic tradition, all monarchs must trace their lineage back to Menelik I, who was offspring of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. In 1930, my late grandfather took the title His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I, King of Kings, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah and Elect of God. These titles had been traditionally given to Ethiopian kings to recognize the Old Testament emphasis of Ethiopia's Christianity and to, clear, to declare the region's sacred duty and subservience to God. That is why frequently Ethiopian monarchs refer to the psalmist quote, princes shall come out of Egypt and Ethiopia shall stretch her hand unto God. 
in Ethiopian tradition, Menelik, who had returned as a young man to visit his father Solomon in Jerusalem, was regally received. When Menelik departed to Ethiopia, King Solomon, which, who was very pleased by the regal manner and demeanor of his royal offspring, ordered the chief priest to, and advisors of, king, of the kingdom to send their first sons with him for the benefit of the Ethiopian crown, which would Menelik would eventually inherit. Among these was Zadok, the high priest, who is claimed took the Ark of the Covenant with him. The theft was concealed from Menelik, who did not learn until the party had returned to Ethiopia. The symbolism of the Ark is particularly potent in Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Every single church must contain a replica of the Ark before it can be consecrated. One of the most important festivals in the calendar of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is Tenkat, during which the Ark, or the replica thereof, is wrapped in shroud and carried in great processional reverence. The Kubranagas relates this marvelous story of how the Ark of the Covenant came to Ethiopia, where it is believed to be enshrined in the special treasury at the chapel of the tablet constructed next to the church of St. Mary of Zion in Aksum. It is reported that the ark was moved to St. Mary's into the chapel because of the divine heat from the tablets that cracked the stones of its previous sanctum. Indeed, my late grandmother, Empress Menon, had paid part of the construction cost of the new chapel. The church of St. Mary of Zion in Aksum is a venerable icon of the Ethiopian religious belief and legend. It is also the most important church in Ethiopia. St. Mary is dedicated to the Holy Mother Mary, who in the Christian tradition was the vessel of Christ, and thus the fulfillment of religious prophecy. Adherents believe that when Mary was exiled in Egypt, that she had also had visited Ethiopia. The original St. Mary Zion was built in the 4th century AD and has been destroyed and rebuilt again. Ethiopia was a respected and sophisticated empire in the time of the New Testament. In fact, the Ethiopian eunuch, in the 8th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, returning from a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, is the first Ethiopian to be baptized by the Apostle Philip. We learn that he is the keeper of all the treasure of the queen, who is named Kandaki, a regal, uh, a regal name. Thus, the eunuch is actually identified as the queen's treasurer, a position of supreme confidence in the royal household. It is likely that the queen was told of this unusual religious encounter when her bedroom returned, and thus the news of the Christian gospel had reached Ethiopia long before the official adoption of Christianity as the religion of Rome and the Ethiopian crown in the fourth century. Written records from about 800 BC to the first century BC are confined to the names of kings found on carvings. However, the Aksumite period is relatively well documented. The Aksumite kingdom represents a significant peak of Ethiopian civilization, which spans the era of conversion of the ruling dynasty to Christianity in the fourth century AD. It was also considered a very advanced civilization by the Roman emperor. Empire. In fact, the Roman Emperor Constantine had declared that citizens of Aksum were to be considered equal with the citizens of Rome. Constantine and Ezana, the Ethiopian king of kings, made Christianity their respective religion in their kingdoms. In the ancient and revered tradition of the Ethiopian Orthodox Christians, there had been three traditional symbols of demonstration and manifestation of humanity's intimate relationship and connection with the divine, and that these are called the three Zions. The first Zion is the Temple of Solomon in Israel, which according to the Bible is the first temple in Jerusalem Jews and is thought to have been constructed around 832 BC. During its history, it was repeatedly attacked and sacked, and according to Jewish religious traditions, before its final destruction by Rome in 70 AD, the temple had in Solomon's time been repository for the fabled Ark of the Covenant. Sequen subsequently, 
Jewish scriptures say that the ark will remain hidden until God gathers his people together again. The Jewish faith today believes that the temple of Solomon will and must be rebuilt before the coming of the Antichrist. Indeed, contemporary Orthodox Jews pray three times a day for the restoration of Solomon's temple. Adherents of the Orthodox faith in Ethiopia believe that according to prophecy, when the temple is rebuilt again, one door is reserved for the Lion of Judah for Christ to open it up again. The second Zion, which, have or, which I have already discussed in some detail, is Mary, the mother of Christ, and the church at St. Mary of Zion in Aksum. The third Zion is the Lion of Judah, who represents the return of Jesus Christ in the fulfillment and biblical prophecy of his coming to rule again. Since the 4th century AD, all Ethiopian sovereigns have given their crown to the church at St. Mary of Zion in traditional adherence and submission to this belief. In fact, the Ethiopian imperial crest depicts an empty throne, waiting in expectation for the return of Christ and the rule of the right and justice. The Rastafarian movement is a contemporary monotheistic political religious movement, which had evolved in the slums of Kingston, Jamaica, from fundamentally Christian roots and culture. In French towns mean an overweening environment of poverty, depression, racism, and class discrimination. The Rastafarian message of black pride, freedom from oppression, and hope of the return to the African homeland had found fertile soil. And within this milieu in the 1930s onward, that the Rastafarian movement developed its own distinctive style of language, hairstyle, art, and music. Although popularly believed to have originated on November 2nd, 1930, with the investiture of the Emperor Haile Selassie, Rastafari has actually been inspired in the 1920s nationalist movement founded by Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican publicist, organizer, and black nationalist, considered by his followers as a prophet and the second John the Baptist. Though there is a significant variation within the Rasta movement, there is certainly no formal one singular organization. Undeniably, some Rastafarians see Rastafarian as a way of life more than a religion. Rastas do not claim sex or denominations, but encourage one another to seek faith and inspiration within themselves. The central and uniting theme, however, of this highly diverse movement are the enduring belief in the divinity and messianship of Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie, the influence of Jamaican culture, resistance to oppression, and pride in its African heritage. For Rastafarians, Haile Selassie is considered to be Jah or God and is seen in both the reincarnation of Christ and the lion mentioned in the Bible's book of Revelation. He is therefore referred to as the Lion of Judah. Beyond biblical allegory and metaphor, Rasta also seen see the lion as being the symbolic symbolism of strength against oppression that they have endured over time. Thus, for Rastafarians, the lion is both symbolic and iconic. The lion can be found on the Rastafarian flag and on many other items associated with the Rastafarian faith. Their name itself, Rastafari, derives from the pre-regnal title given to Emperor Haile Selassie, literally meaning head or leader Tafari, before he, he, he took on the name Haile Selassie. Adopting from the heraldic lion symbol of the biblical line of Judah from which the Ethiopian Solomonic dynasty is descended, Rastafarians believe that the lion represents Emperor Haile Selassie as the King of Kings and reveals the unbroken lineage <coughs> of the Emperor from the 12 tribes of Israel. 